pray all these things in Jesus' name. Burning 
We are going to continue to worship God through the study of his word. I'm excited about today's uh, message. It's one of the messages that I most studied for. I went down a few rabbit holes, so today's message um, is going to be a little bit different. Um, but uh, I'm excited to preach it still. If you want to follow along, there's a lot of good information in your Bible app, so if you do want to take notes, you can open up your Bible app, and like every week, select uh, lower right hand corner, oh, there's more right. events, and look for any church. Uh, the kids the kids can go ahead and, and go to their class, and, 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 uh, and we are going to go ahead and pray, and we're going to jump right in, because we are in the third week of our series titled Rooted in which we are talking about um, the uh, the trustworthiness and the reliability of Scripture and the importance for us to be rooted in such and uh, the reason why we can be sure, right? The reason why, because 
Again, it's one thing for the Bible to say that it's trustworthy. It's one thing for me, a Bible teacher, to say um, that you can trust what the Bible says. And while I do believe that the Bible is true and what it says is true, uh, and I do want you to believe it, I want you more than that. I want you to know why it is that you can believe it, why it is that you can trust in the words of the Bible. And uh, we um, we established uh, last week, you know, that the the inerrancy and the infallibility of Scripture, inerrant meaning there's no errors in it, Infall infallibility, you no, know, there's there's no false in it, is 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 incapable of being false. Um, it, it's so important because again, our salvation depends on that. Our salvation depends on what the Bible says being true, on Jesus truly being who He said that He was, the Messiah, the Son of God, the coming Savior. On on Him. It depends on him doing what he said that he did and that his his life, death, and resurrection actually accomplished what scripture says that it did. Our forgiveness, our redemption, our adoption into the family of God. And if scripture cannot be trusted, then we're in big trouble because it means we have no assurance of our salvation. We have no hope. We have no assurance of forgiveness, of redemption, of, you know, there's nothing we can do about our shame. There is no hope and there's no reason for joy in these temporary uh, times. So, so that's the reason why we're diving into a series like this one. Uh, but again, before we go into any more content, let us pray. So God, go ahead and leads us to through our study today. Amen. Right. Father, thank you once again for this time and for this space that we get to gather, God, in this holiday weekend. Thank you for the birth of the people and families joining here, those that are joining online. And God, thank you for just the honor and privilege that we have to uh, humble ourselves under your word, under the authority of scripture. And God, we trust that the Holy Spirit is present in this place. And we ask you for you to speak, for you to open our minds, open our hearts, and uh, for the truths and, and uh, things we'll talk about today for, for it not to just be information in our minds, but God, allow it to cause transformation in our hearts and in our lives, God. And, and God, I, I pray that, again, what everything I say are not just simply my thoughts or ideas, but help me be an instrument in your hands so that your church, your people, and anybody else under the sound of my voice, God, can hear you today. Um, and God, I pray all these things. And I give you thanks, God, and I do it all in the name that is above every name, the name of Christ. And everybody said, amen. And amen. And amen. <laughs> all right. So the question we're tackling is, is the Bible true? Is it fact or is it fiction? How do we know? How do we know um, that, uh, that we can trust Scripture? If we're going to be rooted in Scripture, how do we know that, um, that it's safe to? So, so far in this series, um, and throughout this series, we're studying seven reasons why. I'm giving you seven reasons why you can indeed trust the Bible, and we're taking two at a time. Today is week three, so we're going to cover reasons five and six today. Oh, I forgot to, I was going to quiz you, and I forgot, I gave you the answers already. Um, but so far, we have talked about the fact that Scripture is historically accurate, it is scientifically accurate. Last week we spoke about the fact that scripture is prophetically accurate and thematically unified. Which you might be like, well, where else can we go? You know, what else can we talk about? And what other assurance does scripture give us that it can indeed be trusted? Well, that's what we're going to jump in today. And like I said, today's message um, is going to be a little bit different. We're going to di kind of dive into history a little bit. So if you enjoy history... I think you'll enjoy uh, today. If not, just give me a few minutes so we can lay a foundation because I do believe that it is important stuff that we're going to talk about today because the reason number five of why it is that the scripture, the Bible, is trustworthy is because the Bible has survived all attacks. The Bible has survived all attacks. I was um, studying this week. And it's interesting to me that the Bible is the most despised book in the world. 
the most denied book, the most disputed, the most dissected, the most debated, the most destroyed. The Bible is the most outlawed and banned book in history, right? There is so much coming up against the Bible. Millions of people have died for the very truths that are written in this book. Many people have died simply because of having a Bible within their person. I found a couple of maps that I wanted to show you. I don't know if you can read it, but here on the lower part where it gives us the key, you have the reddish parts. These are places where it's dangerous or, and or difficult to be a believer. The middle, darker red, is the places where it's illegal and or highly restrictive to be a Christian. And then the dark, dark black is uh, covert operations only, where you can only be a Christian in secret, because if anybody finds out, you'll more than likely be executed. Now, I looked at this map. It looked very interesting, but I have no idea where all these places are. So I found another map that actually gave me a list of places so that I could actually understand. And here it just tells us the top 10 countries that are most dangerous to be a Christian in, starting with 10 China, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Uzbekistan, Iran, Yemen, Afghanistan, North Korea, Somalia, and I love number one, social media is a dangerous place to be a Christian nowadays. Um, isn't that the truth? But the reality is that um, Christianity uh, and the Word of God, it has been under attack from the beginning. From the beginning, the Word of God has been under attack. Now, you know the story, right? That Jesus or God spoke everything into existence, and he said that everything was good. He spoke everything into existence. Let there be light, let there be earth, let there be all these different things came from the Word of God. It wasn't until he created mankind that he got physically involved and actually formed the man out of dust. And with the woman, he was also, again, physically in, you know, involved in taking a rib out of Adam and forming Eve. Um, and then he tells them, hey, be fruitful and multiply. You can have, you can eat up any of the trees of the garden, but then he gave them one command. Don't eat up the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was the one command. Well, you know the story. Here comes the enemy. And what was the first thing that he did? As a matter of fact, this is the first question in Scripture. The serpent, says Genesis 3.1, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say? Questioning the word of God, right? Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, again, um, just deviating a little bit, all I know in my personal life is that any time that I have ended up or I have suffered the consequences of actions, decisions, or whatever it is in my personal life, it was either because I wasn't following the word of God or because I was questioning the word of God. You will never follow the word of God to a place that is going to be harmful or, well, it's not going to be God's will and a blessing to your life. I believe that all of those troubles where we, um, you know, where we bring difficulty into our lives, a lot of times uh, is because we question indeed the word of God. And that was the first question of scripture, the first attack on the word of God. Did God really say? Now, it's interesting because if you continue reading, you know that Eve, she knew what God had told her. Oh no, we can eat of all the trees, but we just can't eat of this one. But then there's another little detail that says we can't even touch it. So again, she's already bought into the idea that the enemy was trying to portray, like God is limiting you for something, right? And this scholar was talking about the fact that right then and there, Eve had already sinned because she was starting questioning and putting more limitations into what God had told her, and he said that actually grabbing the fruit and eating from it is just a product and a result of the sin in her heart. But we see that this is the beginning of the attack on the word of God, but it's definitely not the end. All through scripture, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, 
We see an endless and relentless battle against the truth that God has established. Everything from false prophets, false teachers, evil deceivers, false apostles, and to come we see that there's going to be an antichrist. And there will be future attacks against the word of God. But scripture tells us that the grass withers, Isaiah 48. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. It stands forever. Um, I love uh, this story in the book of Acts. If you remember when um, Peter and John, they, you know, they lifted up a uh, uh cripple and uh you know he, they started preaching the gospel this is the other they went to jail and then finally they were able to actually speak in front of the courts the sanhedrin and in acts 5 38 and 39 um you know they were telling them if you remember they're like saying hey we forbid you to preach and to teach in the name of jesus and peter and paul i mean and peter and john they were like hey that's great, but I got to obey God over what you're telling me. So I'm sorry, but we can't do that. But there was this wise old man, part of the Sanhedrin, that said, Hey, do you remember such and such case? They started kind of trying to do a revolution, and they were following this guy who said he was important. But remember when that guy got killed? That whole movement disappeared. And remember another time when this other guy started saying that he was such and such? And he created a big movement, and people were following him, and this and the other, but then he got killed, and the whole movement dissipated. Then that's the context of Romans, of Acts 5, 38 and 39, that, and he said, therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. It will just go like every other one has gone before. However, if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Now, this happened again just a few weeks after Jesus rose from the dead, after he ascended onto heaven. And uh, for this study, I, I prayed through it and I debated whether do we want to focus on attacks on scripture that are in the Bible, right? Because we could talk about, you know... The attacks and the persecution of the prophets, which were a representation of the word of God in the Old Testament. And we could talk about Daniel, we could talk about Elijah, we could talk about so many different people. Or we could talk about the New Testament, the disciples. We know that 11 out of the 12, or 10 out of the 12, right? Um, they were martyred because of their faith. They, again, represented the word of God, um, you know, in those present times. So we could talk about those things that are indeed in scripture. But I just felt like I wanted to go a different route because either you've heard that before or, you know, we might be familiar with some of those stories. But uh, um, so I want the history. Route. I want to go beyond the Bible. I want to go beyond what's written in Scripture. What other attacks have happened against the Word of God that we see in history that directly impact um, us today? That have, um, you know, that had... Uh, impact on our, on our lives today, whether we had or don't have a Bible today. So this event with uh, Peter and John happened around 30 AD, and history tells us that for the next 470 years, right, they had the Old Testament scrolls, so the New Testament believers and followers of Jesus, they started writing scripture, everybody started making copies, we talked about that in week one, um, and for the next 470 years, those copies started being translated into different languages. Up to 500 different languages were translated in the first about 500 years um, after Christ, right? But in, in the year 382 after Christ, Father Jerome from the Catholic Church, he had the Bible translated into Latin. This is the famous Latin Vulgate Bible which um, Latin was a, the common language in the Roman Empire at this time. And um, however, with time, the Latin language began to fade, and it was only the upper class or those that were very studious, very educated, the ones that still 
were familiar with the Latin language. So in just a few decades, nobody could read the Bible because it was in Latin. And the Catholic Church, they actually, by the year 600 AD, the only Bible that the, the Catholic Church allowed was the Latin Bible. The Catholic Church, again, resisted in more efforts to translate the Bible into languages that people spoke because they, they, they argued that Hebrew, Greek, and Latin were the only languages that were worthy of um, the Bible. So again, by 600 AD, all Bibles were banned except the Latin Bible, which only they could teach and understand because they were of that level of education and they knew the language. So again, uh, unfortunately, this, um, this created a lot and brought a lot of corruption into the church because, again, priests were the only ones who could read and understand and teach scripture. People didn't have act people just didn't have access to it or didn't understand it. So what happened? That gave the priests ultimate power to teach whatever sections of the Bible they wanted or they, if they could want to teach stuff that wasn't necessarily in the Bible, they did that too. It was in that period of time um, where people, they started charging for indulgences, right? They would charge people money for the forgiveness of their sins. They also created this whole thing that is not in scripture about purgatory, where when you die, if you don't go to heaven or hell, you go to this place where you wait. Well, the family members that had people had, that had died, they would say, well, you can pay a certain amount of money to take your family member out of purgatory. So they started, they brought a lot, a lot of corruption. And these corrupt leaders of the church, they attacked the truth of God and they forced ignorance on the people of God and deceived the masses for a period of about a thousand years. That was a definite attack on the word of God. So the question is, this is a picture of the Catholic Church, some depictions of it, charging indulgences. Um, you see the people bringing their money, bringing their coins um, to pay for their loved ones and such. Um, so how? How did the Bible become free? How did the church break free of this? Um, and uh, this was a dark time. It was within this time that the dark ages were actually, um, were, that actually happened. Well, the way that scripture broke through and the, 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 the church broke free from this long, dark, and horrible corruption is that once the Bible, the Word of God, got in the hands of enough people, the right people, the people that God was going to use to bring truth and to bring a very necessary uh, reformation to the church, I want to introduce you guys to uh, some people in history that you might not have heard of. First, there is a Scottish guy by the name of Columba, St. Columba. This, this is his picture in case you want to know. Uh, so St. Columba actually started a secret Bible, uh, Bible society or Bible school where they would faithfully teach scripture and century after century they would disciple young leaders or young people um, uh, and students in scripture faithfully and they were they became known as the Colbees, Colbees. and this secret Bible society actually lasted for about 700 years where they would disciple one another faithfully studying the word of God out of this group of Colbees in this secret Bible society um, God would bring about again the reformation of the church and in the late 1300s there was a guy that was discipled in this secret Bible school by the name of John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe is known in history to be the first guy that actually translated the Bible into English. So because of the word or the work of John Wycliffe uh, and their inspiration from God to translate scripture, many people that didn't have access to scripture before now were able to read it. And in history, John Wycliffe was actually known or became known as the morning star of the Reformation because it was his work that started the ball rolling. And when I say Reformation, I mean like 
people actually acknowledging, hey, this isn't right, right? There's stuff going on. We got to get back to what scripture actually says. Um, so history actually tells us that John Wycliffe died of uh, a stroke in December 31st, 1384. But because he was considered a heretic for translating the Bible into English, there was a pope uh, named Pope Martin V. He was so disgusted with John Wycliffe that he actually ordered some of his you know, people to dig up the bones of John Wycliffe about 41 to 41 years after his death to dig up his bones, destroy them and cremate him, and then throw him in the river, right? Here we see the bones and then the guy, the ashes, uh, being trickled down into the river. So th this was the hate that they had for these people. These people are taking over their, t you know, we're in control, we can't let anybody change what we're doing, that this guy dug up his bones and uh, had him cremated 40, 41 to 44 years after his death. However, Wycliffe had a disciple. He had a disciple, a student that, you know, was being discipled under him. And uh, his name was John Huss. And Huss was equally as uh, passionate about getting God's word to as many people as possible. So, again, he would, um, you know, try to write down scripture and, and give it to people and this and the other. But again, John Huss was also considered a heretic for doing this. And he was burned alive at the stake. Now, guess what they used? to start the fire that killed John Huss. They used the English Bibles of his teacher, John Wycliffe, to actually get the fire started in order to burn him alive. But it was the last words of, um, of John Huss that became uh, world known and became a, a staple of history because while he was being burnt, he declared this truth. He said, in the next 100 years, God will raise up a man whose call to reform cannot be suppressed. Now, if you're following history, you know that that guy that John Huss was referring to was Martin um, Luther. Martin Luther. And uh, John Huss says 100 years from now. God's going to raise up a guy who exactly 102 years later, the year 1517, God raised up a man, uh, Martin Luther, who was so fed up with the corruption of the church and that he believed God was calling him to help bring the church back to the truths of Scripture, to reform the church. And um, Martin wrote his famous 95 Thesis, right, which was a list or a document containing 95 different heresies that the Catholic Church was teaching at the time, and he took that list, or he took that document, and he nailed it to the church, um, the Wittenberg Church, and this event is described in history as the knock heard around the world. The knock heard around the world because he literally nailed that document onto the church. And God used this document and these accusations to again, bring about the reformation of the Protestant church. As you can imagine, Luther was also called and considered a heretic for questioning the Catholic church. So people wanted to kill him and he had to spend much of his life on the run. He had to spend a lot of the time just looking over his shoulder because people wanted to um, execute him. And uh, God also used Martin Luther to translate the Bible into German which was then the common language of the people. And with the then in invented press, the printing press, he was able to uh, make copies of the Bible and get the word of God into the hands of the masses. Now, along that time, in the year 1526, so just about you know 15 or 16 years later, another guy named William Tyndale, this was about 150 years after John Wycliffe, remember, who was the first guy to write the Bible, to translate the Bible into English, but those Bibles got burnt to burn his disciple John Huss. Well, about 150 years after John Wycliffe, 
this guy, William Tyndale, he translated the Bible into English, and because, again, the printing press was already available, he was the first guy to print and mass produce the Bible in English, and um, again, he was considered a heretic because this was illegal, so they actually put Tyndale, uh, he was on the run, again, for about 11 years until they finally caught up to him and they put him in jail for 500 days. And on the year um, 1536, they burned him alive as well. However, while he was being tied up and burned alive, he said a prayer that God would use as a pr prophecy for the future of the church and the freedom of his word. And this was his prayer. Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Open the king of England's eyes. And just three years later, God answered that prayer under the leadership of King Henry VIII. He not only allowed the printing of the Bible in English, but he actually helped fund it. And the Bible that was produced is known as the Great Bible uh, in the year 1539. And uh, the Great Bible, um, again, was in English. It had beautiful art, as you see here. Um, some of the pictures online are awesome, just the way around the wording and everything. It, it really is beautiful what they created. And the Great Bible was the first authorized edition of the Bible in English. Um, and authorized by King Henry VIII to be able to be read aloud at the church. So it was from this that then you get the um, La Reina Valera, the, the, what do you call it in English? The, the King James came much after this, about 30 or 40 years after this. So this was the, the OG, right? This is the original English Bible that was legal at the time to be printed and produced and um, and after this, you know, the word of God again became free. And it was free again for the people to have access to it. Again, uh, fulfilling the prophecies that we see in scripture that heaven and uh, earth will pass away, but the word of God will remain forever in spite of the attacks, in spite of, um, of people trying to destroy it, to ban it, to, you know, discredit it and everything else. The word of God will always indeed remain. Interesting facts about the Bible is that the Bible is the single greatest source of music in all of history, the single greatest source of art, the single greatest source of architecture in all of history. So if you take the Bible out of culture, you actually destroy most of the major music most of the major arts and most of the major architecture of the entire world for about a period of 2,000 years, for the last 2,000 years. The Bible um, is still the most read book in the world, is the most purchased, the most published, and the most translated book in history. And funny, interesting fact, the Bible is actually the most stolen book in history as well. In spite of kings and emperors trying to shut the Bible down, governments and corrupt religious leaders trying to keep it away from the people, dictators and tyrants um, persecuting and outlawing it, the Bible still remains. The Bible has survived all attacks. Why? Because it's not just a human thing. The verse that we read in Acts, if it was something human, right? If their purpose is of human origin, it will fail. It will dissipate. It will be destroyed. It will no longer last. It, it, it just, it'll be, right? It'll just disappear. But verse 39 of Acts 5, but it is, if, if it's from God, you will not be able to stop it. Uh, and you will only find yourself fighting against God. So reason number five for the reason that scripture is indeed trustworthy that we know is reliable is because it has indeed survived all of the attacks that have come up against it that have tried again to keep it away from people ban it and, and everything else which takes us then to reason number six and to finish today 
um, the sixth reason why scripture is trustworthy is because the Bible is, it was confirmed and it is confirmed by Jesus, right? Scripture is confirmed by Jesus. You know, a lot of people say things like, well, I like Jesus, but I don't like the church. I'm okay with Jesus, but the Bible, I don't trust what other people wrote about it. Or, you know, the Bible is so archaic and new. How can you even trust it? And full of contradictions, this and the other. I read some irritating uh, articles this week just of so much uh, just ignorance regarding scripture of quote-unquote um, contradictions that just people that aren't educated or they don't, they don't know where these things come from or how it is that they align. Um, you know, they're grabbing verses out of context and contradicting them with others without really understanding. But, but uh, so people say, yeah, Jesus is cool, but church, but the Bible, no, I'm not good with that. Well, the only problem with that is that first the church is the bride of Christ and Jesus believed in the Bible, right? Jesus believed in the Bible. Was, in fact, during his life and ministry, in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Right? Jesus wasn't coming with some type of new teaching or some type of new something or other that was going to replace the writings of the prophets and everything God had already established in the Old Testament. Because again, the Old Testament was the Bible in Jesus' time. No, he said, no, I, I, I didn't come to replace it or abolish it. I came to fulfill it. Why? For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. I could preach a whole sermon just on that verse, but just very briefly, Jesus believes, according to this verse, that every single letter and every stroke of the pen of the Bible is true. So if I'm a Jesus follower, if I believe in Jesus, I have to believe in Scripture because Jesus believed in the written Word of God. Jesus believed that it will last until the end of time. Jesus believed that what is written in Scripture will accomplish all that God wants to accomplish here on the earth. And what's interesting is that when Jesus spoke of the Bible, he didn't just talk about it as history. He didn't just talk about it as this uh, poetic or art, you know, art book or, or full of poems or things to be inspired. No, he referred to it as something that was life changing, something that would bring blessing into your life. In one, in one instance, Jesus was, was teaching again. This was during the Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, you know, he was saying all the blessed are the rest, blessed are the poor, blessed are, you know, all these different things that he was teaching. And uh, there's a funny um, part in Luke 11, verse 28, where uh, some lady stands up in the crowd and yells at Jesus. She said, blessed is the mother or blessed is the woman that gave you birth. Which... The opposite came to mind because una frase que nosotros usamos, maldita sea tu madre que está ahí, right? <laughs> but the lady said the, the opposite, right? Like, blessed be the mother that gave you birth. But Jesus in Luke 11, 28, he said, no, 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 no. Blessed are those who hear the teaching of God and obey it. Blessed, right? Blessings on your life are the ones who hear the teachings of God and obey it. So Jesus didn't refer to the Bible or he didn't just reference to it as something nice to, to read, to be inspired by the, the poetics of, of, you know, David and, and uh, different things, you know, the Psalms or the Proverbs, or to be entertained by the, his, by the stories written down and the narratives. No, Jesus spoke about Scripture as a real book. He spoke of the people as real people. He spoke of the places as real places, and he spoke of Scripture as something that we can actually apply, something that we can do as a manual to help us, to direct us in our lives, 
and as a result, it would be a blessing to us. Interesting, Jesus, again, he believed in the people and the places that are listed in Scripture as real people, right? Uh, Jesus believed in the prophets. He believed in Noah. He believed in Adam and Eve, right? There's a big argument. No, Adam and Eve is just an analogy used, right? It's just the idea of the beginning of human humankind, this and the other. No, Jesus spoke about Adam and Eve, about the man and woman that God created, right? Jesus believed in, in what occurred in Sodom and Gomorrah and, and even in the story of Jonah. And the, the, the interesting thing is that the last four, right, from Noah to Jonah, these are the most debated stories in Scripture where many uh, people that are not believers or many critics of Scripture, they want to question them. And they want to point to these stories. Oh, you don't really believe in Noah, that two animals really got in the boat, this and the other. Or really, you think that a guy really got swallowed up by a big fish? Hey, I don't know how God made a, you know, a huge fish swallow Jonah and take him to the place where he told him to go in the first place. I don't know how God made that, that happen. But I know that it's in Scripture. And I know that Jesus believed in it because he actually referred to Jonah as an analogy for his death, how he was going to be in the middle of the earth for three days, but then he was going to come back out and bring back to life. So I don't know how that happened, right? Um, however, just the other day, my wife showed me this video that's very interesting. This happened um, off of... Two women were in a kayak in the middle of humpback whale feeding season, and you would see a whale who went to eat some fish that were hovering, right? You see all the fish there. And uh, the whale came up and actually took two kayakers with him, right? They were fine. They survived. They weren't swallowed. But again, it, it sheds light in some of these stories that this happened a few months ago. They posted it on uh, on social media. Uh, both women are okay, but scared, right? Uh, I'm sure they were. You see all the little fish, so the whale went up to eat, and then they caught the uh, the kayakers. Crazy, crazy stuff. But um, I love this quote that I read from St. Augustine. He said, if you believe what you like in the Gospels and reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel you believe, but yourself, right? It's not the gospel that you believe. You believe in yourself, that you are wise enough to be able to just sift through what God inspired to be written, for God protected throughout history in spite of all attacks, and you're just to say, yeah, I don't like that part. I don't like that part. Why? Because it calls me a purity. I don't like that part because it, it calls out my sin. What is that? You believe more in yourself than you believe in God, than you believe in Scripture. You want to be God. You want to be the authority in your own life. Now, I found a fascinating quote in all places, uh, Forbes, on their website. And uh, this is so, the whole article was really interesting, but this part, I had to just rip it off and share it with you. Because um, the quote reads... The enemies of the Bible treat it as a dangerous book in many ways. They say the Bible is oppressive, misogynist, genocidal, racist, sexist, among many other things. And then it says, reality is the Bible is indeed dangerous. It is dangerous to ignore. If the Bible is the truth, then ignoring it is ignoring the truth. Contempt for it is contempt for the truth. Hostility to it is hostility to the truth. And there is nothing more dangerous to a person than to build a life on hostility to the truth. To be at war with reality is to be always at war and always losing. Powerful, powerful words. And the truth is that the Bible is indeed a dangerous book. I love it. It's dangerous to ignore.
Because we've already talked about the fact that the Bible is historically accurate, scientifically accurate, prophetically accurate. It is thematically unified in spite of tens of different authors through a period of 15, almost 1,600 years in three different continents, in three different languages. There is one theme, one image, and it's the image of redemption of Christ. Of Jesus. We saw today that scripture has survived all attacks from the beginning. Did God really say? Did God really say? All throughout scripture, false prophets, false teachers, liars, kings, you know, emperors, so many different people killing the followers of Jesus, killing the representatives of his word. Yet the word of God remains, even through the dark ages, even through the corruption of the church itself, God had a remnant, a faithful remnant, right? Columbo, some were, some Irish guy, in a secret Bible society for 700 years, faithfully teaching scripture because the word of God will always remain. And that's why, that's why um, Jesus, he, he he spoke about the scripture as something real. He spoke of that about the people and the places as something real. And Hebrews, Hebrews 4, verses 12, verse 12, says this. God's word is alive and working and is sharper than a double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us where the soul and the spirit are joined to the center of our joints and bones. What does scripture do? It judges the thoughts and feelings of our hearts. In verse 13, nothing in all the world can be hidden from God. Everything is clear and lies open up before him. And to him, we must explain the way we have lived. The word of God is alive the word of God was confirmed by Jesus itself as being um, real and will accomplish what God is going to accomplish here in the world. And it can accomplish what God wants to accomplish in our lives if we trust it, if we seek it, if we study it, if we follow it, listen to it, and obey. So for these reasons, I believe that the Bible is indeed reliable, true, and trustworthy. And um, next week, we'll, follow, we'll end this series talking about the last reason why uh, I believe that we can indeed be rooted in Scripture. And just as Jesus said, the winds will blow, the waters will raise, and they will, um, you know, they will uh, bang against our houses. But if we are rooted in Scripture, we will indeed remain. Amen. But I Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for these brave men of history. Men and women, surely. But these brave men, God, that just uh, were willing to die, um, God, in order to, uh, God, to just remain, to remain faithful. Thank you for the faith that we see in their declarations, in their their public declarations of faith, that that your word will indeed remain. The flower phase of the, the grass withers, God, but your word remains forever. Thank you, God, for these men that, that brought about the Reformation to, to uh, again, set free the word of God and bring the church and the people of God back into uh, truth, the truth of Scripture, um, into what you reveal. God, thank you that, again, just throughout history, the Bible has continued to be translated and even till to, even today, it's still being translated into uh, different languages so that it can be uh, accessible to, to everybody around the world. Because just as Jesus said, blessed are those that hear the word of God and obey. So God, I pray that after a message like this, that we don't get bogged down in the history and the information, but God put in us, put in us a new hunger, a new thirst, and a new desire for your word, because it is in these pages and these simple words, God, that we see your face, 
that we are directed, that we are uh, taught, that we are corrected. God, that you reveal to us your will for our lives, that you mold us into who you want us to be. So God, again, I pray that you put in us a desire, just a, uh, and, and a hunger, a thirst for your word, for us to consume it, to read it, to, to pursue it, to obey it. Uh, and, and if we do, God, we will be blessed for it and, and we will glorify your holy name. So uh, help us not take for granted the sacrifice of so many people that gave up their lives so that we could have your word today. So God, help us to embrace it and help us to seek you through it. And thank you, God, that we have proof after proof of the reasons why we can trust it and be rooted in it. And God, I pray all these things, and I give you thanks, God, and I do it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God. All right. Well, before we uh, before we are dismissed, I want to uh, just give a couple of announcements. First announcement: I want to remind you of the list that we're supposed to be creating. List of people in our lives, friends, family members that are far away from church that do not know Christ. We want to be writing those names down uh, and praying over those names, and uh, we will I will announce you. To you, when is it that we're going to have a training? We want to have a training uh, just on how to share your faith, how to share with these people, and also we just need to pray that God will, will work in their lives so that um, when we get the opportunity to visit, uh, Jesus has a little bit more information about this, and uh, next week we'll give out more information on it. But uh, there's some missionaries that are coming, and they're going to go ahead and visit certain people. Uh, but we want to be, if they don't have any people, if they don't have any names, if we don't produce that, if we're not praying for that, um, then uh, then we're not going to, you know, we can't do anything. So pray pray about that. Start writing some people down. Uh, even if they're not local and we know you can't visit or whatever, still, let's 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 write those names down and let's, uh, let's take them before uh, God in prayer because uh, I love it. Some guy said that before we speak to people about God. Let's talk to God about these people, right? And secondly, um, we're already in the month of September, so our life groups will be starting soon. I'm going to be meeting with some of our leaders to see how it is that we're going to do it. I know that our group, we were uh, we're thinking that we want to start meeting in person, even if we have a laptop open and some people want to connect digitally, but we do want to meet in person to pray and study the Bible and encourage each other physically. So what I'll announce in the next couple of weeks what it is that we want to launch our groups. Um, but, uh, so that will be coming here in the next few weeks. But again, thank you for joining us, those of you online. And uh, have a great rest of your Sunday and a beautiful week. And we'll see you next Sunday for the finale of Rooted. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.